first speaker today, I'm very grateful to introduce uh, Ruth Hurry, who is the collections curator at the Welcome Collection in London, where she works on temporary exhibitions and the permanent collections. Ruth's background is in history, medical and science museums, and collections research. Previously, she was the collection staff at the, uh, the Whipple History uh, of Science Museum in Cambridge, and a postdoctoral researcher uh, mapping dispersed uh, Iraqi archaeological collections in UK museums. Ruth studied uh, Henry Welcome's medical, historical medical museum for her PhD, and has recently been researching the junior museum staff and the network of people involved in uh, the collecting. And Ruth is really the, the person to go to if you ever want to know any information about the people who worked at Welcome. Uh, so very much looking forward to hearing your talk and over to you. Thanks so much, Ken. Um, thank you for the warm welcome. And it's great to be here today celebrating with you all. Um, so yes, I'm Ruth Horry, and I'm going to be speaking to you today about Henry Welcome's uh, collections and his historical medical museum. I have some notes on the screen to the side, so apologies if I uh, look over that way. Um, but what I'm going to do today is tell you about these collections of the pharmaceutical businessman, uh, Sir Henry Welcome, the private museum and library that managed them. Um, and so starting from the 1890s until his death in 1936, Henry Welcome amassed this collection of historical medical objects, cultural objects, uh, books, paintings and manuscripts from across world geographies and cultures and time periods. Um, so what I want to do is give you an overview of the collecting activities and the display with a few ancient Egyptian examples um, and talk about how and why the collection was broken up after Henry Welcome's death and ended up being dispersed to over 100 museums across the world. I should say that the collections have a complex history um, and numbered over a million objects at its largest point. So what I'll say can only be a broad overview, um, but I'm really excited. There are other speakers at the conference um, who are gonna bring these stories to life in more detail and more nuance. Um, I should also flag I'm not an expert in ancient Egypt, so I'm going to give you my apologies in advance for mispronouncing any names of Egyptian objects that I will talk about today. I want to begin um, with Henry Welcome's private collecting, which began seriously in the 1890s. At this point, he was a Midwestern American immigrant in London, um, and his drug manufacturing firm Burroughs Welcome and Company was making money. They were the first to trademark a form of compressed pills known as the tabloid brand, um, which is now familiar to us as tablets. And their target market was primarily medical professionals who would prescribe these products to their patients. Collecting historic artifacts was a personal interest of Henry Welcome's and something that built him a social group among the medical men who studied and collected medical history. Some of his purchases were inspiration for the company's product advertising. Um, and indeed, some of these historical themes were present in the firm's early promotional material. He employed a pharmacist named Charles Thompson to be his historical researcher, his librarian and his collecting agent. Welcome had the idea in 1903 for a historical exhibition marking the 25th anniversary of his firm. Um, that was the following year, but actually this intention spiralled into being a decade long plan to create a permanent museum and library on a medical theme. Um, and it was fueled by his expanding personal wealth. So it was in 1911 when Welcome actually acquired some premises for this museum, and this was 54A Wigmore Street in central London. Um, and this was also adjacent to one of the company's showrooms. The museum itself opened two years later um, in 1913, and it was aimed at this audience of medical professionals who were Welcome's peers. And its stated aim was showing a history of medicine from the earliest times to the present day. Now, Wigmore Street was only a stone's throw from the headquarters of the Royal Society of Medicine and near Harley Street, so he was targeting the fashionable heart of medical London at this point. In displaying its history, the museum followed a model that's most well known to us from the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, but that was common in museums at this time. So it presented a story of the supposed evolution of medicine across different cultures. And I want to be clear, I mean, these ideas 
are the, the late 19th century ideas and they are racist ideas. They place white European culture um, as the most progressed and evolved, while they term other cultures primitive and unevolved. So that was present in the museum's displays. So visitors would start in the museum in the gallery that's pictured here, um, which has a name that is now offensive. It was called the Hall of Primitive Medicine. And in here were displayed uh, objects from cultures across the global south, so primarily from the African continent. And it was a dark, crowded, uninterpreted accumulation. And it was a mix of cultures and geographies. The visitor would walk through the museum through time periods um, and it would move them through history, focusing on different periods of medical history and also through a journey of supposed medical progress. Um, at the end, they would emerge into the centerpiece hall of statuary, um, which is pictured here as it looked in 1914. Um, in contrast, this space is uncrowded, it's bright, it's filled with statues of gods of healing and medicine. And visitors were encouraged to see themselves as part of this medicine's great history in a direct line from Greece and Rome. So there were also statues displayed in here of gods from other ancient civilizations, including Mesopotamia and China and ancient Egypt. Um, of course, there is a long history of seeing ancient Egypt as part of uh, European heritage rather than as African. And in the image on this slide is the ancient Egyptian god uh, Thoth or Jehuti, who's shown with an ibis's head. Um, and then seated behind him is the god Imhotep. And as this hall of statuary shows, um, items representing figures were of particular interest in the museum's displays. Um, this is one of the ancient Egyptian medicine displays. So it's from Wigmore Street in the 1920s. And there's plenty of statues and figurines in here as well. So uh, mainly those thought to be associated with healing, Imhotep, Isis and Horus, um, and Tauret, the hippopotamus goddess who protected women in pregnancy and childbirth. Um, but the ancient Egyptian collections also included vessels and textiles and knives and tools used in mummification rituals, as well as text on papyrus and mummified bodies, both human and animal. Um, you might have noticed, by the way, that that large statue of the bird-headed god Thoth that I showed you does not look like it's an authentic Egyptian artifact, and you would be right about that. Um, it's definitely not ancient, it's a modern commission that was made specifically for the museum's displays in 1911. Um, so it was by a sculptor named Herbert Binney, and we've actually got archived photos of Thoth and Imhotep statues in the process of being made in the museum's basement. And the original objects were mixed together with casts and replicas and even these modern imaginations with ease. So all of them were legitimate and desirable for Wellcome's medical audiences. Incidentally, I don't know the fate of these statues. They're presumed to have been disposed of at some point uh, through the museum's history because they weren't authentic artifacts. But if anyone knows of a museum that has them, then I would love to know about it. So to talk a bit about collecting, um, the museum's first curator was uh, the librarian and historical researcher, Charles Thompson. And from the opening decade through to the 1920s, the museum and library moved from being managed inside um, Burroughs Wellcome's company business to being a more formalized uh, institute with its own staff and, and processes. Captain Peter Johnson Saint, who is also pictured on this slide, was an army officer who became the museum's chief collecting agent and a roving ambassador. So he traveled across Europe and the Middle East between 1928 and 1934. And as well as these senior staff, there's a larger cast of less central characters who are involved in collecting and museum activities, both in London and globally. Um, I'll show a couple more of them later on. The collecting was large scale and it happened through a large complex network of collecting agents and dealers and intermediaries. Um, as with many collections assembled in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, um, Wellcome's collections have colonial and imperial roots. Um, those structures supported collecting trips and also resulted in the objects that circulated on British auction markets. Um, the museum purchased heavily at auction sales and through dealers, and some of the auction houses that are represented are shown on this slide. Um, they're often abbreviated in the collections records. Stevens is one of the prominent ones, um, and also Christie's and Sotheby's. Museum staff were often sent to bid in, uh, under pseudonyms, but the auction houses still often recognised who they were. 
for the ancient Egyptian material. Um, a large amount was purchased at auction that came from sales of named collectors. So as Robert um, de Rustafel and the British banker Frederick Hilton Price. So did the Historical Medical Museum employ specialists who could actually catalogue and purchase this, you know, catalogue these purchases and read the ancient languages? Well, to some extent, yes, although the specialist knowledge and the language skills were always much harder to get hold of than the ancient objects that the museum purchased. Um, to give you an example of one of these specialists, um, this is William St. Chad Boscarwen, who worked on the museum's ancient Egyptian material between uh, about 1906 and 1913. He specialised in ancient Egypt and the ancient Near East, and he was proficient in Assyrian, Babylonian languages and hieroglyphs. Um, he was a reverend son from Wrexham, and he started out his academic career at the British Museum. Um, he impressed the senior curators with his skills, but apparently um, he fell into bad company, according to the archive records. Um, the quality of his work suffered, and he ended up being dismissed from his post. Reading between the lines of these archive records, he experienced some periods of ill health, both physical and mental, throughout his lifetime. And this was a time when there wasn't much social support in society. We know that from 1903, he spent his later career in freelance work at the Historical Medical Museum. He purchased at auction sales, he researched and transcribed the cuneiform tablets, and he also catalogued the ancient Egyptian material. In January 1907, he describes finishing work on the cartonage, the painted linen and the mummy cloths. Um, and Ken's going to speak a little bit more about Boscarwin's work in his presentation later this afternoon. Sadly though, Boscarwin never saw the opening of the Historical Medical Museum. He actually died in April 1913, which was only a few months before the first visitors walked through the doors. Another way that the museum acquired objects was on collecting trips by staff and employed agents. So Captain Peter Johnson Saint, who I mentioned previously, collected around Europe and the Middle East on yearly trips, purchasing from dealers and private sellers. Um, and I'll give you a few ancient Egyptian examples, but that was actually a tiny proportion of the material he collected. So he visited Egypt in the mid 1930s, viewing ancient temples and excavation sites and commissioned casts of reliefs and friezes on Wellcome's behalf for display back in London. So in this slide, you can see some of them on display in the Egypt gallery in the 1940s. In the ceiling is the uh, Osiris Chapel ceiling from the temple at Dendera, showing the constellations of the zodiac. And interestingly, the cast here was assembled from um, separate pieces, some cast in situ and others from the Louvre in Paris. And that cast is actually now in the Science Museum's collection in London. On the left wall, there are some birth scenes of Amenhotep III from Luxor, um, and they're now at the Hornemann Museum. And there's also, uh, we believe, some birth reliefs from Deir al-Bahari in this photo. The far right has the statue of the head of the heretic king Akhenaten, which is actually a cast from the Cairo Museum, which uh, Saint also purchased. So Saint wasn't the only travelling collector, although he did the majority in Europe and the Middle East, and he did it for the longest. But there are also people involved in anthropological fieldwork who were funded to collect objects, um, and that was particularly between 1925 and 34, which is when the museum focused increasingly on anthropology um, under its curator, Louis Malcolm. Collecting in Egypt specifically, a Wellcome's Museum funded an anthropologist named Winifred Blackman, um, and Frances Larson's going to be speaking more about her later on today. The museum also acquired collections from archaeological excavations in return for sponsorship. So that's including excavations by Flinders Petrie, by Brunton at Mostagheda, and by John Garstang at sites including Meroway. Um, this papyrus fragment is from the Book of the Dead. It's from uh, Abydos and it was given by Flinders Petrie, I think in 1927. And that connection is shown on the museum catalogue card for it, which is on the right. Um, and I believe this, this papyrus is now in the Petrie Museum um, and there's another fragment um, that's now at Swansea. So Henry Wellcome also funded um, his own private archaeological excavations, um, particularly in, in Jebel Moya in Sud Sudan, which was excavated for four years. Um, and you'll hear more about this as well from uh, Isabel Bella Gregory straight after me. So in 1932, the Historical Medical Museum moved to do new premises. 
So this is the building on Euston Road in London, um, and the displays I've just shown come from there. Um, it also housed welcome scientific research activities as well. As, um, and in the present day, this is where I work when I'm not working from home. Um, and when we are thinking about the display of Henry Wellcome's collections, it's important to say that displays are only really the tip of the iceberg. Um, most of the collections were held in storage in buildings across London. Um, acquiring things for research and study was a central aim of the museum, although the reality of that research access fell way short of the ambition. Similarly, the small number of staff that were employed to uh, manage the collection could never keep up with the large volume of items being acquired. There is something of a myth though that uh, most of the collection remained uncatalogued throughout its time in the museum. I mean this isn't actually the truth, there are over 600 boxes of uh, archive documentation that survive of the museum's activities and among them are 56 accession registers and hundreds of boxes of catalogue cards. Um, of course the knowledge uh, around those objects was depending on who was actually um, and what they knew. But this is the accessioning room um, at Euston Road in the 1930s where the objects were registered and at the back are the catalogue card boxes and at the front the typewriters used to type them um, and pictured on the slide are just a few of the curatorial or scientific staff who were working at Euston Road. So Molly Bora catalogued and curated some of the African collections, Theodore Gaster um, worked on the Egyptian and ancient Near Eastern material and Chang Yi was an artist and writer who worked on the Chinese collections. Um, I should say certain parts of the collection were definitely less well documented and it's not clear how much of the Egyptian material actually went through the cataloguing process, um, which we know from some of the crates sent to the Petrie Museum in the mid 1960s, um, which according to documents from that time hadn't been catalogued. So Henry Wellcome's museum collections were at their largest point um, in 1936, which is the year when Henry Wellcome died. So at that point, the collection is estimated to be about a million objects in size um, and larger than the Louvre's collection in Paris at that point. And it's helpful to think around of Sir Henry, the collector, as a magnet that holds the collection together. So after he died in 1936, um, the trustees that were appointed to oversee the estate began a process of rationalising the collection. So parts of it started to be separated off and dispersed to other places over the next 80 or so years. This is mainly through auction sales and some disposals, but mainly through transfers of gifts and loans to other museums. Materials now held in over 100 institutions across the world. Much of what we know about these movements actually comes from work that was done by museum workers involved in practically moving the collections, particularly in the 1980s. Um, the best account is still one that was written by Georgina Russell in Museums Journal in 1986. Um, it's still an essential starting point for understanding what happened. She was a transfer officer herself tasked with finding um, new homes for material, and she also researched the earlier movements documenting as she went. Um, and this Google map that you can see uh, was made using the data in her lists of uh, institutions that received collections. The reasons that the collections were separated were, were varied over the 20th century and they're tied to changing ideas about museums and about academic study. After Henry Wellcome's death, the collections were legally owned by the commercial company, but they were managed by his trustees who also managed the other assets as well as the museum and library. So this complexity of management situation combined with the museum's enormous size is important for understanding this dispersal process. So immediately after Wellcome's death, um, the dispersals mainly occurred through auction sales. And these were for financial reasons, including items from Henry Wellcome's private home. So the trustees were liable for taxes on the value of Henry Wellcome's estate, which included the collections, so these sales helped to pay for the death duties. There were 27 auctions held by Harrods in conjunction with Allsops um, in a mansion that was especially rented for the purpose. And there were also further sales during World, uh, World War II and some disposals of wood and metal for scrap to aid the war effort. 
In the years between 1949 and around 1960, um, when a large amount of the anthropological or ethnographic collections, as they were described then, um, were dispersed, so collections originating from across the Global South, the trustees had decided not to pursue the broader scope anthropology museum that Henry Wellcome had increasingly desired, the so-called Museum of Mankind. The sheer diversity of the collection was practically unworkable and the academic landscape was shifting away from the encyclopedic type museums of the of 1900. So the trustees narrowed the focus towards history of medicine. The British Museum agreed to store these ethnographic collections temporarily during the war years and assist in distributing them to other museums. In return for that, they were offered the first selection of material, um, followed by other museums that sought to rebuild their collections after the Second World War. Representatives selected from items that were physically laid out at the British Museum, and there were 10 rounds of dispersals over seven years. There were some items that were also offered uh, to institutions back in their countries of origin. In 1960, Wellcome's trustees officially purchased the collection from the commercial company, so they got more direct control over the management. And it was in this period of the 60s and early 70s that the large dispersals of Egyptian and Sudanese collections happened. The ancient Egyptian collections were rehoused with the Petrie Museum in, at UCL in 1964, um, and after they selected material that was excavated by Flinders Petrie and by Garstang for their collection, um, the Petrie acted as a redistribution centre for material. So around 1971, representatives from Swansea University, Birmingham, Durham and Liverpool were invited to choose material for their collections. And a lot had to be chosen sight unseen in crates after an initial inspection. Now I'm aware that there are museum staff here today from those particular museums um, and they're going to know a lot more than I do about how the material arrived in their own institutions. So bringing everyone together today is a chance to really better understand these Egyptology dispersals. There was also at this time a large gift of African collections to the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, to what became the Fowler Museum. In the late 1970s, the Wellcome Trustees took the decision to further rationalise the remaining collections. So this photo is part of the Welcome Museum stores in Enfield in North London uh, at the, as the last wave of the dispersals began. Um, and the remaining historical medical collections were then placed on permanent loan to the Science Museum in London, where they could be displayed for public benefit. And this collection of around 117,000 objects has been cared for and managed by the Science Museum group ever since that point. And Welcome Collection works closely in partnership with them still. And if you want to hear more about the Science Museum collections, uh, Selena Hurley will be speaking about the Egyptian collections tomorrow. There was also around 68,000, we think, further non-medical items that were distributed to another 80 museums in this final wave of dispersals. And this was mainly through gifts, and it included Egyptian objects and cast as well. Finally, Henry Wellcome's collections of paintings, historic books and manuscripts, um, they were retained at the Wellcome Trust in the Institute's library. And these have grown into the rich collections that are held at Wellcome Collection, where I work today. So they represent a wide range of perspectives on health, um, both historical and contemporary. So you might ask, is it actually possible to trace where all of the Wellcome items ended up? Um, I mean, this is very challenging given the size and the complexity of the dispersals and also the fragmented nature of the documentation. A lot of the collection records are handwritten, they're not text searchable, um, but new collaborative work is making this easier. So if you'd like to know more about that, my colleague Alexandra Evely is speaking on Friday um, about a new project to transcribe this documentation, which is making it possible to start searching for collection items and piecing together these dispersals, so do tune in for that. And just to show you finally um, where Egyptian and Sudanese collections were dispersed to, this is another map put together from Georgina Russell's lists. Um, we know that there are now ex-welcome objects in Birmingham, Bolton, Cambridge, Durham, Glasgow, Ipswich, Liverpool, London, Manchester, Oxford and Swansea. Um, there are also the Jebel Moya finds from Sudan uh, at the British Museum and at the University of Cambridge. 
So I'm looking forward to hearing more about these histories and these collections over the next three days. Um, and really, I've come to the end of my talk now, um, and I want to finish by just saying that although the Welcome Historical Medical Museum itself was disbanded, it was wound up after the last wave of dispersals, the collections themselves have all been given new beginnings in new places. Um, and we, we can see this in the 50 years that the Egyptian collections have been at Swansea. The museum's been researching them, it's been engaging audiences with the stories, and these all, are all in ways that simply weren't possible within the walls of the Historical Medical Museum. I mean, mainly the walls of the storerooms. Um, but it's the same in all the other museums as well that have received material. These dispersals have brought the collections out of the stores and they've also brought them to life. Um, and I think particularly on this 50th anniversary of the collections coming to Swansea, um, that's something that's well worth celebrating. So I'm gonna finish speaking there, uh, hopefully with some time for questions, um, but thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Ruth. Uh, excellent introduction into the, the Welcome Collection and uh, Henry Welcome himself to really set the tone uh, for the next three days of the conference. And as you say, we're very grateful uh, for the donation or the, the loan of 4,000 or so objects from the Welcome, uh, Welcome Collection. Without it, we wouldn't have the Egypt Centre uh, that we have today. Uh, if anybody has any questions, then do please post into the Q&A button and we'll get through as many as possible. So far, we don't have any, but I have a question for you. Um, with the various agents that Welcome sent to the different auction houses, did he have specific ones who would go to, let's say, Sotheby's and another one who would go to Stevens, or did they mix and match and go to different places? That is a good question. Um, my sense from what I've seen in the catalogues is it, it feels like it's a mixture. Um, but I think, again, this is a, a case where we're only starting to get to that picture of studying who exactly was going where, whose particular knowledge was um, being used at these auction houses. Or Because we know, for example, that someone like Boss Garwen was also sent to look at sales. So if there would be particular um, items of interest, particularly if it involved reading ancient languages. Um, there are some reports that are then sent back to a curator like Thompson. Um, but yes, there are annotations in the auction catalogues um, by various members of the staff. So it is a broad range of people um, that were purchasing and, and um, the names of the purchasers are often recorded in the documentation. So we can see that. Extremely valuable. And it's really great that these are now being digitized and made available online. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I've put a link on this final slide through to where you can browse and search the Historical Medical Museum um, and Library Archives and Welcome Collections website, um, including some of the images that I've shown today, which are also available. And a, and a slightly related question to that is, we have someone asking, as well as looking at dispersals, are you currently researching how items came to be acquired too? Yes, definitely. And the records obviously are important for both. Um, and I think we are now in a better position through the digitization and this new work that's happening to start being able to understand the patterns of acquisition as well as patterns of dispersal. Um, and that's on not just the scale of individual objects, but also um, looking at the intermediaries so who were collecting on behalf of Welcome that really help give us those deeper uh, stories of provenance and of acquisition. And uh, just the final question there from uh, Jasmine Day uh, is uh, she's asked whether any of the Egyptian material came from the collection of General Sir Francis Grenfell. I have to say, I can't answer that without some more research, but um, we can definitely look into that and um, see if there's anything that comes up. Um, I can let you know because we have some in Swansea. So, okay. yes, yeah. So they, the chances did, are, yes. Buy quite a lot from Grenfell Seal. Yeah. Amazing. There we go. That's exactly why I'm glad that um, we're here today, working in collaboration. As I say, we have some in Swansea yeah. uh, as well. We do have more questions into the chat, but as we have a tight uh, schedule, we will uh, we will stick to it. Uh, but uh, perhaps, Ruth, you can answer some of the questions in uh, via text into the chat. Uh, 